As you know, I am a leader in the field of spirituality, health, and wellness. For that reason, what I'm about to tell you may shock you, but I'm going to ask you to let it shock you. Let it shock you awake, because the reality that you're sitting on may just be built on shaky foundations. And the reality I'm going to tell you is that the field of spirituality, those practices, most of the practices in health and wellness, self-help, they're nothing more than one giant coping mechanism. What does it mean to cope? It means to deal with something difficult. What's a coping mechanism? A coping mechanism is an adaptation we make that enables us to deal with a difficult environmental stress that we feel like we cannot change or eliminate. The adaptation we make causes us to feel like we have control over the way we feel and behave. I'm going to give you a kind of a flow chart. This is how it goes. We interact with a stressor in our environment, something that causes distress. Instantly, we have thoughts that come up in response to that distressing external circumstance. Thoughts like, I just can't deal with this. As a result of that thought, your emotion now comes up. Emotion like panic. That emotion of panic converts into physical sensations, like a racing heartbeat or a feeling like we have to get away. And that sensation instantly converts into a behavior, like drowning ourselves in alcohol. Now what we could say about coping mechanisms is they interfere with any part of this process. Looking at this definition, it's easy to see how we could use a coping mechanism to benefit ourselves or other people around us, and or we could use a coping mechanism that doesn't benefit us and the people around us. But the thing we have to really expand our consciousness to perceive is the fact that many of the coping mechanisms that we think are good for us and good for people around us and good for the world are in fact the opposite. They are a detriment to ourselves and to people around us and to the world, but we just didn't see it. Now, what I'm going to tell you is that the spiritual field, the self-help field, the health and wellness field is absolutely littered with coping mechanisms that instead of benefiting you are a detriment to you a detriment to people, and a detriment to the world that you live in. Also, the spiritual, health, wellness, and self-help fields are littered with coping mechanisms that should be used in one circumstance and avoided at all costs in another circumstance. The coping mechanisms that are detrimental always backfire eventually. They may work to alleviate pain in the short term, but they create either worse pain in the long run or create different kinds of pain. Many of them function like a pain medication. They stop us from feeling pain. Now, if we understand pain, we have to ask ourselves, is this always the best option? There's no denying that alleviating pain sometimes might be a good idea, but other times it might be a direct affront to healing. It might be dangerous to not be able to feel pain. In other words, sometimes if you use a strategy to numb or dull yourself to the pain, you never change the situation. You just get used to it because you don't feel it anymore. We can generalize for the sake of this episode that there are eight basic coping mechanisms. One, avoidance mechanisms which help you to avoid the stress. Two, attack mechanisms which deflect the stress and pain we feel onto other people instead. Three, behavioral mechanisms which change what we do in response to the stress. Four, adaptive mechanisms which offer constructive help for the distress. Five, cognitive mechanisms which change what we think in a situation where we are faced with distress. Six, defense mechanisms which enable us to defend ourselves against the perceived stressor. Seven, self-harm mechanisms which hurt ourselves to try to sedate or resolve distress. Eight, conversion mechanisms where our emotional and physiological distress manifests as physical symptoms that act as a communication strategy.
The point of this episode is not to get you to go into the nitty-gritty details of every single coping mechanism besides there's tons of information out there where you can do that. It's to get you to look at the potential that those tools you're using for your own spiritual practice fit into these categories. Let that scare you a little bit. Let it scare you enough to take a look at some of these Let's call them precious spiritual practices, the ones you're the most attached to. But look at them through the lens of, is this me coping with something? I am not suggesting that all of these spiritual self-help, health and wellness tools are bad for you. I'm not suggesting they should just be discarded. But I am suggesting two things. One that by definition a coping mechanism is an adaptation that we make to enable us to deal with something that's stressful that we think we cannot change. And so we have to really ask ourselves whether this coping mechanism we are using is in fact just enabling us to stay in a situation that should be changed or not. Are we adapting to something that shouldn't be adapted to but should be changed instead? And two, I am suggesting that many of the coping mechanisms that we use in the world, even your spiritual methodologies, you may think are benefiting you and are benefiting the people around you and the world at large, when in fact they are doing the exact opposite. And you just don't see it from your current perspective. I am asking you to develop genuine consciousness by taking each one of the spiritual beliefs and spiritual practices you have and asking yourself with an attitude of curious philosophical exploration how could this potentially be a detriment to me and to those around me and to the world at large? What could be the shadow side of this belief or practice? If you need help, take each one of these beliefs or spiritual practices that you are using and compare them to a list of coping mechanisms. See if one of them fits, if they're a match. That will help you to see the potential downside or negative aspect of that particular coping mechanism slash spiritual tool that you are using. For example, one of the spiritual beliefs that's the most common that everyone assumes is good for everyone is the concept that everything is all perfect because it's in alignment with the divine plan. Now clearly, suspending the idea about whether this belief is true or not true, we can see that this is a brilliant coping mechanism. It enables you to cope with difficult things to believe that it's part of a grandmaster plan. Also, this could make it so you take no action in the face of atrocity when action is absolutely necessary. A person with this belief could sit back and watch as the world goes to war and tragedy occurs, letting other people suffer alone as they sit in a space of approval of it. This could be a form of denial, which is in fact a well-studied coping mechanism. Now I want you to think about the harm that this belief that everything is all perfect, that it's all in alignment with the divine plan, could do to a woman whose child was just crushed in an automobile accident. Imagine saying this to her. What would that do? Not only does it leave her alone in her pain, it completely invalidates it. It suggests that the only reason that she's feeling pain is because she's ignorant to the fact that there is a greater divine plan. Now we have a word for that. It's called emotional abuse. In order to become fully conscious and to make the right choice of spiritual tool to use or to give other people at a given time, we have to see the shadow side of all of our spiritual tools. We have to see the shadow side of spirituality in and of itself. And yes, I'm sorry to break it to you. It's the atheists that saw the shadow side of spirituality this time. What they saw that spiritual people don't see is that most people find their way to spirituality how? because they're in distress and in pain. And so, the shadow side of spirituality is, it's a giant coping mechanism. <laughs> it can be a sedative and a painkiller for the masses, every bit as much as it can be a tool for awakening. Now think about how dangerous that could be. Think about how spirituality and spiritual practice could in fact be the exact opposite of conscious. As a teacher, I cannot tell you how often I see people who are convinced that they are working on themselves, that they are becoming more and more conscious and more and more capable, when in fact, all they are doing is developing stronger and stronger and stronger coping mechanisms. 
many of those that in fact require becoming less and less and less and less conscious. One day these strategies will backfire. They will harm you and the world around you. What if the coping mechanism you think is positive is actually negative? What if the spiritual belief or practice you hold feeds unconsciousness instead of consciousness? The reality is we want to be like the people who cope with the world the best. This is what our worship of gurus is really about. We want to be like the person who never shows any signs of distress. We want to be the person who's learned to feel no pain, no negative emotion. These are the people that we exalt the most. But I am warning you to be very, very careful. Because the person who copes the best is often the person who does the least to change the world. They are often the people who do the very most to teach millions of other people to cope with the world. If your spiritual practice is something you use to cope with the distress that doesn't make you wrong, it also doesn't make spirituality wrong. And provided that you genuinely cannot change the situation that is causing you distress, which, believe me, is often a matter of perspective, there are coping mechanisms that will, in fact, benefit you in the world around you. But stay open to the idea that what benefits you today may be a detriment to you tomorrow. Be open to the idea that what sets you free today may imprison you tomorrow. Be open to the idea that what you think benefits you and the people around you may actually harm both you and the people around you. Be open to the idea that these beliefs and practices that we think benefit us, but that actually harm us, may be some of the most sacredly revered and widely held spiritual beliefs in existence. In a previous episode, I said that the dream that will not die in people who have developed an inclusive consciousness, those people who have had a secondary awakening, is the dream of creating a world that does not have to be coped with. After all, if we are the creators of our reality, there is no good reason to argue that it is better to cope with the world the way it is than it is to change the world into something that doesn't need to be coped with. Have a good week.